today we put the, the scenario, the oil abundance scenario, to the test. Two months ago, I sent around emails to the analysts who were behind these reports, who were behind the theory that we're talking about, and I asked them, are you willing to be challenged on stage, live, all at the same time, all at the same place? The response was enthusiastic. So it is that today we're privileged to have six of the energy thinkers to, to put to, to scrutinize the age of oil abundance. This session is on the record. It's being broadcast live by C-SPAN 3. It's being webcast live on the New America website. Um, if you please turn off your phones uh, or turn off the sound on your phones. If you wish to tweet from today, please use the hashtag delve in to 12. So let's begin. Uh, the first session, which will scrutinize the golden age of oil abundance, is going to be moderated by Michael Levi, who runs the Energy and Security Program at the Council on Foreign Relations. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for inviting me to moderate this panel. That's a ton of feedback. Thanks. I think Steve's put together a fantastic structure for today's discussion. We're ha going to have two components to it. This first one is really about kicking the tires on scenarios of oil abundance, understanding what assumptions go in, what factors might affect outcomes, and trying to decide how plausible, how likely these are. And then the second, we'll talk about the consequences. And so we'll separate those two pieces, I think, in order to have a really rigorous discussion. In order to first talk about where we are heading and where we might be heading, we have two fantastic uh, panelists, discussants with us. The first uh, will be Adam Siminski, Administrator of the U.S. Energy Information Administration, uh, who was previously, briefly, Senior Director for Energy uh, and Climate at the National Security Council staff, and before that, uh, for seven years, Chief Energy Economist at Deutsche Bank. Adam will be giving us essentially the base case. EIA is sort of the gold standard for government forecasts of the energy world, and he'll be talking to us about what they see in the future. The second presenter will be Ed Morse, who is Managing Director and Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup, and really uh, the man responsible for identifying a lot of the trends that we're all talking about now and really trying to flesh them out. Uh, when everyone else is putting out three-page papers on the issue, he's putting out 100-page ones. I don't know whether his staff uh, enjoys that, but it is a benefit to all of us in giving us really robust data and information to talk about. Uh, he's previously uh, served at, as uh, head of commodities research at Credit Suisse, chief energy economist at Lehman Brothers, and as deputy assistant secretary of state for international energy policy. Uh, so no more introductions. Uh, Adam, you've got eight minutes to tell us uh, the your view and the EIA view on the future. Ed, you'll have eight minutes, and then we'll have a chat. Are we going to have the slides? Yeah. All right. Do we have the technical help that brings up the slides? Otherwise, I'll do it without the slides. Well, this is a good opportunity to thank. Uh, is this working? <laughs> now it's working. OK. And there are some slides. We're in good shape. Okay, I'd like to uh, thank the New America Foundation for the forum. It's a great opportunity. Uh, Steve and uh, Michael, thank you. And Ed, it's always a pleasure uh, to see you. In the uh, very quick amount of time, I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of uh, a detail on these slides, but I just want to set the scene, and I'm going to particularly use the U.S. Uh, as an example. But let's start off with some world numbers. This comes from the EIA's uh, uh, annual energy outlook that was just published uh, uh, just a little bit ago. 
Uh, we're looking at global oil demand growth uh, between now and 2035, uh, going from roughly um, 89 or 90 million barrels a day now up to 110 million barrels a day. Almost all of that growth is going to be in the non-OECD countries. And that has interesting implications that we can come back to. Uh, this is kind of fascinating to me. This is just the next few years. But look at where the main growth in non-OPEC production is. Uh, the United States uh, leading uh, the, the table here uh, with, uh, with tremendous uh, oil and oil liquids growth uh, in 2011, 12, and 13, uh, followed by Canada and Russia. Uh, China, Colombia, Kazakhstan, Brazil, all of these countries are likely to continue to see production growth, uh, we believe, uh, out into the future, and that has uh, implications uh, that we'll be getting into. How is this happening in the United States? Uh, tight oil production uh, in places like the Bakken and Eagle Ford formations uh, growing uh, very, very strongly into uh, 2012 and likely uh, to continue along those lines as the industry gets more comfortable with tight oil development. Uh, how much tight oil uh, production we could see in the U.S. is going to depend at least in part on what the actual reserve base is. It's still early days. Uh, looks pretty good. Uh, if we, uh, in the EIA reference case, uh, that will support a certain level of production, but a high um, estimated ultimate recovery case or a high total um, uh, reserves case uh, could push production or potential production uh, numbers up even higher. Uh, the reference case is the darker uh, shade uh, here, but as you can see, there are a number of cases, particularly uh, with uh, high uh, reserves where net petroleum imports shrink quite a bit uh, as you get out to 2025 and 2035. Uh, obviously, the net imports number is going to depend on uh, not just domestic supply, but what's happening uh, with demand uh, as well. Uh, so let's, uh, you know, again, look at some of the possibilities here. Uh, the reference case uh, in the EIA's uh, annual energy outlook for the U.S. shows dependence on uh, imported petroleum will shrink from about 50 percent in 2010, uh, right now we're already down below 45 percent, uh, to 36 percent in 2035. Uh, if we uh, were to take the high uh, production case and combine that with the low demand case, uh, that number uh, could be 14% uh, down close to 3 million barrels a day. It's not um, impossible to think of some cases uh, that would lead to uh, even uh, further shrinkage and uh, dependence on net imports. Uh, if you had higher uh, oil prices and more conservation, if you had uh, uh, stronger fuel efficiency standards, if you had uh, better technology in the demand sector, uh, including uh, things like uh, how much oil is uh, being consumed in home heating uh, or in commercial heating, all of that uh, could lead to uh, further uh, shrinkage in that import number. One thing uh, that I think that you should keep in mind in all of this, and then I'll close on this topic, is uh, a, a bit of caution uh, in terms of interpreting what it would mean if the U.S. were to uh, become self-sufficient in oil. Uh, the uh, Harvard Kennedy School uh, just published a report uh, a month ago uh, suggesting that even if the U.S. were totally oil independent, uh, we would still be dependent on uh, global oil markets in terms of price setting uh, and the critical importance of Middle East uh, and foreign policy issues would not go away uh, despite uh, the potential uh, for oil imports to uh, shrink considerably. So with that, I'll close and uh, we'll turn it over to Ed now, I think. Don't 
put it up. I'm going to use the slides, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, Steve and the Foundation, for setting this up, and thank you, Adam, for setting the stage. Uh, what's happening is a really big deal. I'm not going to talk about uh, foreign policy issues right now. Uh, we're going to have time for that later, but uh, trying to deny that this is a big deal is like trying to deny that the internet would have uh, significant implications. This is, what's unfolding is truly a technological revolution uh, assisted by entrepreneurial capacity among a bunch of independent companies in North America and the capital markets uh, of North America that have, with the assistance of higher prices over the last decade, been able to exploit uh, geology that was hitherto outside the scope uh, of mankind. And there, it's not just the shale-like resources uh, of North America. There are three levels of unconventional resources that high prices allowed technological innovators to tap into. And these are clearly the deep water, uh, they are the oil sands, particularly in Canada, uh, and they are the uh, tight formations from which shale and source rock has managed to escape, uh, not completely escape, but to escape into uh, slightly more porous rocks that high new technology can make even more porous uh, and enable the world to tap into. And we know the scope of the source rock. We know more or less the scope of the resource base. We don't yet have a technologically defined set of numbers about commercial resources. So just to put the technological revolution in kind of perspective, uh, even though the, uh, the resource base for the shale-like oil plays, uh, only a slight increment for the U.S. resource base. The source rock itself uh, is many times larger than the amount of oil uh, that uh, is commercially available globally. If there's a trillion and a half uh, barrels of oil that are uh, available globally, uh, there's a trillion and a half barrels of oil source rock in place in Wyoming, there's a trillion and a half in place in Utah and Colorado, uh, and there clearly is at least uh, in terms of what will be commercial, 100 billion uh, barrels, and that's kind of enough uh, in North Dakota, Saskatchewan, and Montana. This is a big deal, and it's not just America, uh, it is the world as, as a whole. Uh, our report looked at North America, uh, and it's important for North America. Our numbers are significantly less conservative than those of the Energy Information Administration. Uh, we looked at uh, what is potentially available, and by the way, our numbers on Mexico uh, show a different profile than the numbers Adam showed from the EIA, which quite conservatively show a continued decline uh, in Mexican production. Uh, I think the world is going to find at the end of the year that Mexican production will be up year on year from onshore production. Uh, there are discoveries offshore and deep water that have just been announced. Uh, the full results of experimentation and the extent extension of the Eagleford from Texas through the other side of the border uh, are just uh, becoming publicly available. And there's no reason to assume that the geology won't work. What, what, that what there's reason to be uh, somewhat skeptical about is whether a company like Pemex can do what the independent entrepreneurial companies of North America can do. And let me be very specific about this. What has m allowed this to work and what makes it difficult for this to work in a, a company like Pemex or Saudi Aramco or even Exxon is that the entrepreneurial independents empower people at a significantly low level in the hierarchy to make decisions about drilling uh, and to experiment on drilling. And, um, and this enables the entrepreneurial companies to do things uh, that others can't do. Now, what, what has triggered this clearly was on the natural gas side. What's happening on natural gas is truly important and cannot be ignored. Because if we look at the oil balances in North America, we have to think of where natural gas is going to, by the end of this decade, almost certainly start displacing oil consumption. One of these, by the way, is in natural gas vehicles. And it's probably going to unfold pretty quickly and probably uh, in the heavy-duty truck fleet 
So I want to just make a note on this, uh, and we can talk about it later. Uh, the economics of converting the heavy-duty truck fleet from diesel to natural gas are compelling. It costs about $7,000 to do the conversion without having a new rig, without having a new engine. Uh, and that $7,000 can be made up in more or less in a year, because depending on where in the U.S. you might be able to get uh, an LNG or CNG for a truck, and that is a big issue. Uh, it costs, in compared, comparison to a $4.5 per gallon diesel, you can have the equivalent amount uh, of natural gas feeding for somewhere between $1.10 and $2.50. Uh, so the economics on that are really compelling. And uh, we, in looking at potentially a 2 million barrel a day uh, decline in U.S. consumption, have a not very aggressive conversion of the uh, trucking fleet from diesel into natural gas. Um, I want to uh, uh, talk about what triggered this revolution. It was high prices. The high prices certainly had an impact in North America, first with the shale gas play, but it is really global. And um, when Robin and I were trying to build a uh, petroleum finance company uh, uh, in uh, the uh, early 19, mid 1980s, one of the first things we were able to do is get a contract with the World Bank where we looked at investment cycles in the oil industry uh, and we looked at uh, the things that go into capital expenditures. There are six things that go into capital expenditures on the upstream side. Those six things explain a lot about the peak oil fad and they explain a lot about what's happening. Uh, the uh, total capital spending in the world for on the upstream side peaked in today's dollars at 200 billion in 1981 and then sharply fell off as oil prices fell off. Among the six elements of upstream capital spending is enhanced recovery, extending the life of a field, low prices make that uneconomic, lead to the early abandonment of a field, leads to an increase in decline rates. Um, and we saw that one of the areas of capital expenditure is an acreage acquisition. Companies were long on acreage in 1981. They lived off of that length in acreage for uh, two decades as the price of acreage, the cost of it, went down. Uh, in 2002 three, for a bunch of reasons related to OPEC, companies thought it was wise to start investing. I have two minutes. And they started increasing capital flows by sixfold. And the results of that are just coming home to roost. So that what's happening in, in North Dakota and Texas and uh, Ohio and Pennsylvania on the gas side and the oil side and the NG NGL side is a reflection of the results of CapEx globally. And it's happening in the deep water as well. It will happen uh, in the deep water Gulf of Mexico again as drilling activity has now resumed. It's a big lead time between the release of the capital and the results of it. Uh, and the chart on your right shows that uh, for most years before 1980, uh, 84, the amount of oil discovered, excluding extensions and revisions to old discoveries, uh, was more than the amount of oil consumed. For this period of, year in which the, of years in which the industry was living off of old investment, the amount of oil discovered was less. Uh, and now uh, the evidence is clear that discovery rates are significantly higher than and will remain significantly higher than oil consumed for a period of time to come. Uh, what's required to keep this going is clearly high enough prices. Uh, this is a map, it can't be seen, but it's the 250 most recently discovered field and fields and their economics. Uh, most production in today's prices can be done uh, at $70 a barrel. Um, some of it can't be done if prices fall uh, below, much below $70 a barrel. One has to ask a question about the sustainability uh, of oil prices, which is another issue. But if oil prices are sustained uh, at a robust enough level, there's plenty of evidence that the production growth that we've seen can continue. And thanks very much. and dig down into some of the assumptions behind these cases. But I want to start by actually asking each of you, when you look at the other's case, what are the one or two biggest differences, not in the outcome, which we can see in the total numbers, 
but in the assumptions that go in. What do you see as the biggest factors explaining the difference in the projections? Maybe Adam, I could ask you that first. Well, Ed was looking at a, a global case, and the numbers that I was presenting were for the U.S. Uh, but so ne next year, the uh, EIA will actually be publishing the International Energy Outlook again. That's one of the decisions I got made in the first few months there that I'm at the EIA. I don't know whether anybody noticed, but we also had a Brent oil price forecast and the short-term energy outlook, which came out yesterday. The, uh, Let's say for the North American case, right, he puts out on there that you could come close to self-sufficiency or, in fact, beyond self-sufficiency for North America by 2020. And that's certainly not in any of the cases that the EIA has out there. Where, well, what no, do you that's, think that's, the that's actually not right. Um, if we take the low demand case, combine that with a high supply case, you're down to U.S. net imports of 3 million barrels a day. Uh, but uh, if you combine, you know, most of that or more than that with, is already coming from Mexico and Canada. Uh, so that would actually imply uh, on a total North America, Mexico, U.S. and Canada basis that you would be uh, independent. One of the things I think that you should keep in mind um, is, uh, and it was on that, that last slide uh, that I showed, a number of the different cases that EIA ran in the annual energy outlook. Uh, not all of them lead to lower demand or higher production. I mean, there are uh, possibilities uh, with stronger economic growth, for example, that could lead to higher demand uh, or uh, problems on the production side. Uh, that, uh, that you know, maybe the resource base isn't, just doesn't turn out to be as, as uh, good as expected, uh, or that there are complications in terms of the costs associated with hydraulic fracturing. Uh, all of that could lead to lower production, which would then give you uh, a, a uh, situation where the U.S. would still be uh, importing, um, you know, let's just say five, six or seven a million barrels a day of oil in, in the period uh, out beyond 2025. It's not, uh, it's not impossible to conceive of the circumstances. I'd say that in general, uh, the direction that we're going is uh, towards more optimism on, uh, on higher production and, and lower demand. Ed, same question. What are the big sources of the different outcomes as you see it? Well, one of the, the things that I, I should make it clear is that when we did this report, we did a report based on what could happen, all other things being equal, and I think it's important to bear that in mind. But among the things we saw happening was uh, with the resumption of drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, a doubling uh, of production there from the deep water uh, based on uh, pretty decent information coming from, uh, from companies. So. I'm, I'm pretty confident that if there's not another Macondo disaster, we're going to see a very robust growth, more robust growth than, than uh, the EIA has. Uh, when we looked at onshore production, we uh, interestingly ran a lot of regressions based on efficiency improvements. Um, and, uh, and the surprising thing to us, which also gave us uh, more robust numbers than the EIA has, but surprisingly, we have understated the degree to which efficiency gains uh, have been uh, growing. Uh, we uh, have a, I think, now more significantly robust view of Canadian production than the EIA has, and that's partly based on new revisions uh, from Canadian producers and the Canadian government. Uh, and we have an uh, uptick, actually, in Alaskan production. So I, I think the major differences is, uh, are found in the deep water and, uh, and our judgments about efficiency improvements in tapping uh, new technology into a very robust resource base. So what I hear is essentially it's a series of micro-analyses of different opportunities rather than different macro assumptions about the uh, investment environment and so yeah. on. Let me ask something about timing because, Adam, when I, when I said you know, your scenario doesn't have a North American uh, independence case by 2020. I picked 2020 on purpose. 
right? If I look at the charts you had up there, you got to that point by 2035. And Ed, you have it happening sometime between 2015 and 2020. So I think maybe I'll ask you first, Ed, you talked about this study you did of cycles uh, a long time ago. Uh, what makes you confident that you can ramp up production at that pace without running into the sort of cost inflation and logistical constraints that might stop you in your tracks? Yeah, well, there's actually some history that you can use on, on costs. Um, you, if you take a one-year look at costs, you uh, see much more inflation in the last year than you would if you take a three-year moving average of costs. If you take a three-year moving average of costs, basically upstream costs, the way we look at them have come down. Uh, I know some people who look at them see them going up. I don't like their methodology, so, uh, and I'm happy to debate with uh, the firms that do that, what their methodology is. But I, I, there are technological improvements that bring, uh, that have been bringing costs down. Uh, I, you know, I think that's the, sort of the, the most important point. Okay. Adam. You have a lot of different, you talked about how there are a lot of different cases and that there are downside cases as well, particularly if you have low global oil prices. Can you talk a bit about that? How big is that possibility? How big is the risk that Ed's case or even your reference case gets undermined by uh, low global oil prices, whether because of Iraqi production or low uh, global demand uh, because of economic weakness? How do you think about that? Well, to a certain extent, I think you have to be uh, a bit careful that the, the assumptions that you make about high production and uh, don't come back and, and result in the lower price argument. Uh, if, if there is tremendous success on the production side, both in, in uh, the OECD countries, uh, in North America and outside, uh, as well as uh, improvements in places like Iraq, uh, Libya, uh, and elsewhere uh, in the OPEC countries. Uh, it's very possible, uh, and technology improves, and as Ed is saying, costs come down, uh, the net result could be lower oil prices rather than higher oil prices. That could uh, ultimately prove to be a, a, a circular kind of, of argument. Uh, we've seen that happen before. Uh, it's not clear to the, to the bulk of the analytic community that uh, oil has to be 100 or 125 or 200 dollars a barrel in the uh, EIA's uh, high oil price case uh, to, uh, to get the supplies needed to meet demand. And uh, we have seen occasions where oil prices have come down pretty sharply. Uh, if uh, I, I think the markets ultimately will set the price, and and we'll have to see how strong the oil rig count remains, both in the U.S. and and globally, uh, if uh, prices continue to to move south. Uh, so success on the production front and technology front could lead to. Uh, lower prices, which ultimately would uh, would reduce the incentive for production or further enhancements in technology. Let's take that thread a little bit uh, further. I know when people talk about the potential for prices to come down, the typical response is that OPEC will modulate production in order to keep prices relatively high. They have revenue; the member countries have revenue needs, and so on. And is there a point where those countries, there's so much volume coming from elsewhere that those countries have to make a choice between how much they sell and the price they get, um, and that causes prices to come down and undermine North American production? Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that a lot of uh, what is unfolding has resulted from effectively an OPEC subsidy of drillers uh, and uh, built into a model, at least for a short period of time, is the issue that you just raised, namely um, the fiscal requirements of commodity producing countries. And it's not, by the way, just uh, Venezuela and Iran. Uh, it's also Russia, which has a higher break even uh, number even than Saudi Arabia, which is much lower than, uh, than those. So uh, I think there, there are a whole bunch of trade offs. Some of it uh, are trade offs that are already developing. So um, this is, 
you don't have to wait for North American energy independence to see some of this unfolding. Uh, if you look at the rate of decline of imports into the U.S. Gulf Coast of oil from West Africa or Northwest Europe, uh, Northwest Europe in part because of declining production, but West African crude had been selling at a premium to Brent. Uh, we are importing less and less crude from West Africa. By sometime in 2013 uh, on current trends, the Gulf Coast will import no crude from West Africa. And what used to be two and a half million barrels a day of imports will be more or less order of magnitude, 300,000 barrels a day, all going to East Coast refineries. And this is already a challenge for Angola and Nigeria uh, among the OPEC producers. By the time uh, a few years roll by and there are a couple of pipelines that bring uh, Canadian crude currently selling at $50 a barrel uh, down to the U.S. Gulf Coast, um, it would probably mean that the U.S. needs to import no oil from Venezuela, no oil from Saudi Arabia, no oil from uh, uh, from Iraq, and uh, that also poses problems because the quality of, of that crude specifically um, is attractive in U.S. Gulf Coast operating refineries, and there aren't many outlets other than the U.S. Gulf Coast for that crude oil. So there will be, you know, very specific pain inflicted on uh, particular oil exporters, even without energy independence and even without uh, a flood of oil coming out of uh, uh, out of the new production. Adam, I don't want to misquote you, but if I remember correctly, you've been cited recently saying that uh, depending on the development of North American oil production, uh, you might, for logistical reasons, uh, see attempts to export, per perhaps to export uh, light, uh, light oil and import uh, heavier uh, in order to take advantage of the refining capacity that exists here. If political barriers make that impossible, how do you see that affecting the outlook and the potential for expansion of uh, American and North American more broadly supplies? Right. Well, it's always, uh, I think, a good thing for me to, uh, to state that EIA uh, tries to, to provide the best unbiased and nonpartisan uh, energy research uh, for uh, its customers, uh, and we don't do <laughs> policy. Um, level of exports of energy products including natural gas and oil is a policy issue that is being worked on uh, by uh, appropriate policy making agencies. What EIA can do is I think uh, try to, to bring some facts to it. I think Ed uh, was already alluding uh, to the fact that uh, we may see through Bach and crude oil production for example a tremendous and Eagle Ford in Texas a huge surge in uh, production of light sweet crudes and condensates uh, going into a, a refining uh, system in the U.S. that was uh, designed to upgrade um, heavier higher sulfur crudes particularly in the Gulf Coast. Uh, what that suggests is ultimately it, it might make some sense to try to look at this from the standpoint of what would be best from uh, the overall uh, national interest of the U.S., what would help from the standpoint of uh, growth in the economy, uh, jobs and so on, while you know, managing whatever the environmental issues are. Uh, I, I think that if you were to say uh, we continue to see an increase in domestic uh, light sweet crude oil production, uh, and uh, if you made that assumption and then further assumed that, uh, that some kind of export uh, policy was not going to be allowed, the net effect would be to drive prices down for those uh, crudes. Uh, lower prices for those crudes would mean that uh, potentially that they would not be developed. You wouldn't have the rigs drilling, you wouldn't have uh, people employed in doing it, and the benefits of that to the economy uh, would be lost. Uh, so uh, that would be the case. We have a ways to go before we're going to you know, be faced with that, uh, but it's certainly uh, worth policymakers considering. Would you reach a point where the price got pushed down enough that people invested in refining capacity suitable for that kind of oil? It's hard to see uh, a great deal of, of investment in the U.S. I think more likely what you would see is, uh, as is already occurring, uh, shifts in the transportation system designed to move uh, light sweet crudes in places like uh, North Dakota uh, to the East Coast where the refineries are uh, are set up to uh, 
that more of them are designed to handle lighter sweet crudes. Uh, that's going to require changes in infrastructure. We're already seeing some crude moving by railroad. More of that will occur. Uh, there is talk of extending pipelines uh, to, uh, to move the crude in the, in the direction of the refineries that could use it. Before I go to questions, Ed, I want to ask you one more thing. You've written that the one big potential barrier to the scenario that you lay out is opposition on environmental grounds. Can you talk a bit about that? How do you see that potentially unfolding? And what exactly do you mean by opposition on environmental grounds? Well, the, the, the American public has been split on a whole bunch of oil issues for a century. And those splits uh, of perceptions of the national interest have not gone away. And in many respects, they have, uh, uh, they've gotten exacerbated over time. There are people who, for what they perceive to be legitimate reasons, don't like using dirty material uh, or, uh, or extending the usefulness of what are dirty things. Uh, uh, as part of what we do, and it it's, uh, comes in uh, in a couple of layers. There are people who uh, don't like importing uh, environment, environmentally unsound, or what are perceived to be environmentally unsound, uh, crude oil processed in environmentally unsound ways from Canada. Uh, there are people who are opposed to exports, largely on the grounds that it perpetuates uh, environmental uh, damage or questions the integrity of the environment physically at the plant of refineries or in the plant of uh, in the plants of uses of uh, of hydrocarbons that have waste products th that uh, are either on the land or, land or in the air uh, so so I, I think you know it's clear that we have a very robust set of uh, environmental interests in this country uh, who don't like extending the life of hydrocarbons you talk about a variety of different sources. You're talking about offshore. You're talking about uh, tight oil. You talk about Canadian oil science. Is all of that uh, something that you put in the question mark category based on public environmental concerns, or is it, so or is some of it more uncertain than others? Well, I think there is uncertainty, and then we've not had a decent public debate on these issues uh, either at the he head of state level or uh, in uh, on the Hill. Um, the I think it's been fortunate uh, for the development of this industry that so much of the resource base comes from uh, private hands or private land or state lands rather than federal lands. So, um, and that, that's been good in terms of development. It has stifled the debate to some degree. On the other hand, it has enabled the growth of best practices on a state level and, and an industry level. Um, Specifically, if you look at fracking, there are issues related to the adequacy of aquifers. There are issues related to the integrity of aquifers. There are uh, issues where uh, different reasonable people have their minds rest in different places. Uh, I don't know whether I'm a reasonable person or not. What I can, am concerned with among these is not whether uh, aquifers can uh, have their integrity, integrity maintained through decent cementing practices. Uh, I think the above ground waste disposal is a particularly difficult issue. Um, I think the annoyance of having truckers who, you know, let's face it, have a higher incidence of drug use and alcohol use than most other elements of the population is something that is of concern, should be of concern, uh, and has an impact on uh, waste disposal. Um, underground uh, injection of uh, Hydro fracking fluids uh, has been associated with unusual seismic activity in places like the Midlands in the United Kingdom or uh, Youngstown, Ohio, or Fayetteville, Arkansas, and that uh, also strikes me as a legitimate concern. Uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that most of these concerns can be dealt with at a higher cost, uh, and the question is what is that higher cost and uh, how does the industry bear it? Well, I had a very interesting conversation a couple weeks ago with the mayor of Youngstown, who is both pro-development and had his house significantly damaged by one of these earthquakes. <laughs> uh, let's take a couple questions from the audience. Please put your hand up and I will point. I believe there's a gentleman with a microphone who will bring it to you. Um, over here along the aisle. Yes, I was wondering if you could uh, tell us how long it would take for the Brazilian pre-salt 
production to come online and what impact that will have. Well, I'm happy to address the issue. Um, some of it is uh, an obstacle that should not exist. Some of it is an obstacle that potentially should exist. Uh, in terms of the costs, uh, you know, one of the, the great changes of the last decade and a half has been the growth of a deep water drilling fleet, in, which numbered 17 in 2000 uh, and now numbers closer to 300, which is one of the reasons that I'm kind of bullish about deep water exploration. I think uh, when it comes to elements of resource nationalism, uh, the uh, inevitable temptation to buy Brazilian material, the inevitable temptation to reduce competition between a state enterprise and international oil companies has significantly slowed the progress of development as finally the, uh, the new CEO of Petrobras has admitted in putting in place what uh, may be a more reasonable projection. That more reasonable projection doesn't affect uh, judgments about what the ultimate level of, of production will be, but rather the path of getting to that ultimate level of production. Ed, very quickly, just to put this in context, compare the scale of the Brazilian potential to the other pieces that Steve laid out at the beginning, the various discoveries in Africa and the North American scene. How big, of, how big a picture of this supply growth, uh, how big a piece of this supply growth picture is Brazil? Uh, it's a big piece. So if you look at uh, deep water production in the U.S. when we hit you know, 1.7 million barrels a day before the Macondo disaster, that was 30 percent of uh, global production, a number that had gotten to that level uh, of roughly 4.5 million barrels a day uh, pretty quickly. Deep water had been growing uh, at about a 10 percent per rate per annum, and there was no reason to think that that was going to uh, stop uh, in, in, in the next decade. So. Uh, the Brazilian piece of that, you know, doubling from 2 million today to 4 million by 2018 and now by 2022 or whatever the number is, is a, it's a significant number. We have time for one last quick question. The gentleman back there. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill Murray from uh, Oil Daily. Uh, when we're talking about uh, by 2020 the possibility of having uh, in the, you know, imports down to less than 3 million barrels a day and including NAFTA probably being net net long, and stay away from the policy, of course, uh, does it make any sense whatsoever to start to consider to ask the question about uh, spare capacity in the U.S. And, it, and what value that would be as a tool of, of what strategic value that would be? Is it too I soon think to that's a great question for the next panel, panel <laughs> uh, where we'll talk about broader implications of, uh, of this. So I'll ask, I'll, uh, let me turn it into a question about uh, the resource base. Are there parts of the resource base where the initial capital investment is low enough that you could imagine there being essentially standby capacity in the United States? Well, actually there is now. If you look at the natural gas part of this business where, uh, you know, there's no export release valve and there's no demand pickup, we have effectively spare capacity. Uh, and if you look even at the 9 BCF a day and at the 65 BCF a day market, where uh, natural gas has displaced 100 million tons of coal in the last 18 months. Uh, you can think of that as a surplus capacity. But prices are going to go up, and when they go up, that resource base is like a just-in-time inventory uh, of production capacity. Adam? One of the, uh, Ed bringing up the, the natural gas uh, situation, I actually wanted to do the same thing. Uh, it kind of addresses two questions that were asked here. Uh, one is that, you know, can you conceive of a possibility that oil prices, at least in the U.S., uh, you know, or globally could be forced down? Well, we have the example of what happened with natural gas prices. And uh, if you uh, were to extend that uh, into the resource base, I think it's also really fair to say that uh, even five years ago and certainly ten years ago, nobody uh, had any idea of what the development of the gas resource base uh, could be and would end up being in the U.S. And it's very possible uh, that we might discover exactly the same thing about oil, that the resource base would support much higher production uh, than current estimates. We are out of time on this panel. Uh, thank you, Adam and Ed, for a fascinating discussion that I think has helped us 
understand what conditions might be required to see this age of abundance uh, come to pass and what uncertainties uh, there are as we look forward. Uh, we're going to move straight into the next panel where we will discuss the implications of all of this. You're off. You're, you're leaving? Are you staying? geopolitical implications of that. Panelists now are going to assume that that the uh, that the age my of oil abundance my uh, no, my, audio. sorry. <laughs> the panel now is going to presume it's not being better. <laughs> is the sound on? S sound on here? Yeah. All right. The the panel now is going to presume that the age of oil independence does materialize and look not at the energy implication, but the geopolitical Im implications of shoving all those millions of barrels of oil uh, of surplus onto the global market. The moderator is uh, Susan Glasser, who's the editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy Magazine. <coughs> Thanks, Steve. Thanks to everyone. Can you hear me now? No. no. OK. <laughs> How about this? OK. All right. Here we go. We have a cast of thousands, as you can see. So <laughs> luckily, the good news is no opening statements. <laughs> no, I mean, this is really this is a, a terrific uh, opportunity, I think, to have a conversation uh, that all of us are looking forward to having, uh, which is what are we supposed to make of it? So let's not throw more numbers at everybody, I think, right now for the purposes of this discussion. Steve has given us strict marching orders, but let's take as a given the idea that uh, this new age of relative uh, North American oil and gas abundance is upon us, and let's start to really unpack what are the geopolitical implications of that. And. Uh, you know, obviously it's speculation, but that's great. That's a Washington sport uh, that we all excel at. So I think uh, it makes for a, a pretty good conversation. It's such an all-star cast. I'm not going to slow us down uh, with long introductions, uh, but we do have Michael Levy, who you've already heard from, who's the director of the Council on Foreign Relations Program on Energy, Security, and Climate Change. Adam Siminski, uh, who you've also already heard from, uh, who is the administrator. Uh, administrator of the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Ed Morse, who is the Managing Director and Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup. Ed Chow, who is a Senior Fellow at You're the Energy... you <laughs> 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 oh, I'm sorry, Robin, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Robin West, who is the Chairman and CEO of PFC Energy. Ed Chow, uh, who is... Uh, a senior fellow at the Center for Strate Strategic and International Studies, uh, and John Hoffmeister, who is the founder and CEO of Citizens for Affordable Energy, and of course was the president of Shell Oil Company. Uh, so I, I, again, I can't think of a, a better and more distinguished group uh, to sort of walk us through what some of the consequences are uh, and where we agree and, and probably disagree about some of those consequences. Uh, so I'm actually going to jump right in here, uh, and I'm going to ask uh, Ed Morse, who said recently uh, that this new age uh, of abundance in North America uh, beckons to make North America look like the new Middle East. Uh, so maybe you can start us off with what your tour uh, of the geopolitical horizon looks like uh, when all this oil and gas comes online. Yeah, um, 
I know you don't want any numbers, but I'm going to have to give some. And it starts <laughs> with the fact that <coughs> the U.S. has a current account deficit of 3% of GDP. Our oil import bill is 5% of GDP. You can paint a bunch of different pictures, but one of them that you can't avoid is if this happens, the current account deficit will no longer be a significant issue. Uh, and as uh, Michael Mandelbaum has argued in various places, as have others, uh, the current account deficit and uh, protection of the dollar has been one of the big Achilles heels of American foreign policy. Uh, and we will be freed of the shackles of that, uh, if nothing else, looking to a world where the dollar uh, would likely be maintained as a reserve currency for a long period of time. The other thing that uh, comes as a consequence of not uh, having the current account deficit impact uh, judgments about foreign policy is we can have a better value-based foreign policy. We're no longer going to be kowtowing to despotic rulers or feudal monarchs who, uh, whose uh, oil supply lines are critically important to uh, other aspects of foreign policy. And those trade-offs uh, will be eliminated. I am not, because I know others will get into other areas, but these strike me as two really obvious places where uh, energy independence makes a big difference. Well, I definitely want to survey the group on whether they agree uh, fully that we're no longer going to be kowtowing to dictators uh, anymore. But quickly, uh, Robin, you also have made some very interesting uh, sort of sweeping sense of what this new age of energy independence could mean for us. I think you called it at one point uh, the energy equivalent of the Berlin Wall coming down uh, to talk about America becoming uh, perhaps the, the world's top producer again. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant was that this was, a, um, as the Berlin Wall coming down, changed our perception of the world and our role in it. Um, um, I think from an energy standpoint, I think it's very important that there are two things. One, when to include Canada and the United States, um, mm -hmm. you then have um, uh, the U.S. as self-sufficient. Uh, energy independence is a dangerous term. Rex Tillerson said he didn't quite know what it meant, and I tend to agree. Um, but if we're self-sufficient, um, uh, several things happen. One, I agree entirely with what Ed's points are. One of the things also is there's tremendous change of crude flows and that West African crude and Middle East crude, it's already moving more to Asia and it's going to move even more. And as a result, Asian countries are going to be much more um, uh, uh, focused and influential on those parts of the world. <coughs> by the same token, I was asked by a senior diplomat from the Middle East last week, do you think that the American people will support 100,000 troops being sent to Kuwait 10 years from now to protect oil. I said, I don't think so. Um, uh, I think this is a tremendous challenge for the military. There, there's one other thing, though, that, and Ed sort of alluded to it, that I think is terribly important in all this, is that this was a um, tremendous uh, m private sector free market success in a period of, of stupendous market failures in other sectors. Mm -hmm. and. Um, this happened, um, uh, the federal government had no role in this. Uh, 94, 95 percent of the resources are on state and private land. The feds had nothing to do with it. Um, it was a complete surprise to everybody, but it was driven by uh, <coughs> independent companies being very innovative, um, uh, responding to high prices. And people forget that there were brownouts uh, in 2005, 2006. There were a million people on the Brooklyn Bridge from gas brownouts um, um, uh, in the summer of, I think it was 2005. It was a big crisis. Mm -hmm. um, prices were high and the market worked. And I think if you look at so much energy policy, I think a lot of politicians feel that um, energy, as Clemenceau said, war is too important to be left to the generals. <laughs> uh, and I think that um, uh, politicians believe that um, um, uh, energy policy is too important to be um, left to the market. And I think markets work pretty well, and I think demonstrate this. But there's one last point that I think people have overlooked, and that is that part of the narrative of the United States going back to the 70s was that we were an energy glutton, um, and we were wasteful and spoiled. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, the president likes to say, well, we're 4% of the population, we, presumed we consume 20% of the energy. But the fact of the matter is, the U.S. economy is roughly 20% of the global economy, and we presume roughly 20% of the energy. Mm -hmm. um, that's about right. Um, uh, population is a uh, demographic, not an economic input. Um, and um, 
Um, the fact of the matter is that the whole narrative of the U.S. in the world and its role in the world and uh, our, as I say, this sort of selfish energy glutton, that's going to change as well. I mean, I think this is, I do think this is on the scale of, of uh, the Berlin Wall coming down. But I would also point out there was a book written after that came down called The End of History, <laughs> um, which was completely wrong. Um, <laughs> And I think that that um, uh, maybe it was just ahead of its time. <laughs> Way <laughs> ahead. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that a lot of thought is in a lot of places around the world. There are tremendous decline rates. Um, the notion that uh, there won't be tightness in oil markets globally. Um, I think there will be tightness in markets. I think that uh, certain technologies, uh, renewable technologies, they may not work here because gas prices are so low. But they may work in a lot of other places. Anyway, I mean, I just I think we kiss. It isn't over. This is part of a, a continuing saga. Mm -hmm. There's just so much to unpack here. I do want to bring in John because you talked about sort of the role of private uh, companies and you know, I think 2005 to 2008 was when you were you know sitting from a very interesting vantage point. Uh, how would it look if you were sitting there today in terms of in your role as not only head of a company but as a, a geopolitical czar of sorts, right? You know, how has the landscape changed from when you were leading an oil company. My last advice to the board of directors of Royal Dutch Shell when I retired in 2008 was to steer capital away from the United States because the United States was so confused on energy policy going forward that government had taken on, not just in the current administration but prior administrations as well, the role of disabler rather than enabler. And as we move through the 50s, 60s, and 70s of the last century, government was the primary enabler of the great expansion of the economy that occurred in the post-World War II period with major uh, legislative movement uh, to make things happen for the American economy. And I think until the American government, the federal government in particular, comes to grips with whether it will be the enabler of prosperity or the disabler of markets, uh, which it seems to have a, a, a much higher priority in disabling, uh, I, I think if I'm heading an American oil company looking at use of capital in America, uh, I would be very careful. I would be very selective. And I think that's really what we're seeing. There are so many American companies out there, however, that have huge capacity and the entrepreneurial spirit is alive and well that we are seeing what we are seeing. But trees don't grow to the sky. We learned that a long time ago. And so all the prospective growth in domestic energy supply could be achievable, but it also could not be achievable, depending upon the kind of macro policies that we will set at a governmental level. Market only has so much strength. And yes, private landholders and state permits have enabled what we've achieved to date. But we could do so much more. We really could do so much more, not only in oil and natural gas production, but in substituting natural gas as a transportation fuel uh, in the internal combustion engine by making methanol, let's say, from natural gas with flex fuel engines. And we could more rapidly displace oil imports if we chose to change some of the fuels we're using. At the same time, we open up more of the assets, the, the domestic assets that we have. Uh, but here's a limitation that we shouldn't forget. The oil and gas industry today has 100,000 job openings it can't fill. We don't have an immigration policy that works. 100,000 jobs going begging, which would otherwise accelerate even more uh, activity in the oil and gas fields. An educational system that is not bringing forward the STEM-educated students that are necessary to equip the companies with the numbers of graduates they're going to need going forward. So it's not just natural resources, it's human resources that matter as well. And I don't know a single, I spent Monday in West Texas, I spent Tuesday in Louisiana, and everyone I talk to can't find machinists, can't find truck drivers, can't find people that'll pass the drug test, can't find skilled offshore workers, can't find engineers, can't, 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 can't. This is a limitation that we ought to be worried about as a nation, and it's not just the oil and gas industry that can do something about it. There are other systems and institutions in the country that have to help this process. Mm. So I want to quickly take this actually outside the U.S. for a second and 
I want to ask Ed Chow, what about the rising countries and the demand from China and India, new players, uh, Brazil obviously is a producer, Russia uh, is a producer. How does the rise uh, that we're presuming for the purposes of this conversation, how, how does it scramble what, we, what our assumptions are about the relative political uh, weight of those countries uh, if they're uh, looking at the U.S. in a different way? Does it change things or are we being overly optimistic and thinking that it gives us a stronger hand? Um, I, I think it changes things. I'm not sure it always changes things the way we hope or expect them to be changed. But certainly in terms of energy investment around the world, I think in a time of plenty, which is what we're assuming, it would take the zero-sum game nature of the conversation out of the equation. Uh, we have this mixed feelings about Chinese uh, energy investments around the world. Um, and uh, if there was not a concern over the lack of supply here in the United States, uh, maybe that concern uh, will, 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 will dissipate. In fact, we have already seen this. We haven't noticed it, which is why, uh, which, which is the interesting part, that it, the, the amount of Chinese investments in North America uh, it, it has not raised the kind of concern that the Unical uh, um, uh, purchased by Chevron mm -hmm. uh, uh, did uh, when uh, Chinese oil company Sinook uh, was interested in Unical. So we've already uh, seen that a more, much more relaxed attitude towards uh, China's investment uh, abroad and, and, and India would be following suit very soon. After all, they are the incremental demand centers of the world now, not the OECD countries, not America. Uh, in this time of plenty, their economy will continue to grow at two, three times our natural uh, growth rate. Uh, so it, 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 it takes away that element, which from a geopolitical standpoint, I think is healthy. Mm -hmm. It was never a, a very healthy phobia that, w that we had uh, to begin with. Uh, I, I know you told me in, in the hallway that I should try to disagree with someone. <laughs> uh, uh, so so I, I would do my best. Of a moderator uh, I, I would do my best <laughs> to, to probe the idea of whether we are really going to be less concerned about Middle Eastern oil. Yeah. And, and whether it, it is true or not that American people, at least the American government, will no longer be sending troops to liberate Kuwait or anywhere else. Um, uh, because we have become or will become more energy self-sufficient. Um, Middle Eastern oil and gas is still important to the rest of the world. And our economies are intimately linked to the rest of the world. Uh, there is only one global power that can secure that supply today, rightly or wrongly. Uh, are we therefore going to uh, relinquish that role are we therefore going to cooperate with others, and I'm thinking again about China and India, uh, in terms of the global responsibility of making sure through oil and gas supply that the global economy is also healthy and not just our own domestic economy? Uh, I'm not so sure. I would like to probe that notion a little bit. Um, clearly, it's, this is not going to happen overnight. There will be a transition. Would that change the thinking on Washington's part of about a blue and water Indian Navy, a blue and water Chinese Navy. Uh, this is a, 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 a panel on geopolitics. I think this is the, the sort of thing that we haven't really thought about very much and it needs to be discussed more in this town. Mm -hmm. Now, Michael, I definitely want to bring you in here. I have to admit that many of my facts for this conversation ha have come from his terrific piece in the new issue of Foreign Policy magazine uh, in which he urges us to think again about the American energy boom. And I, I think one, you also have brought, I think, a little bit of a note of questioning uh, to the conversation about how much uh, does a new moment of energy plenty translate into a moment of more political independence uh, from the Middle East. Uh, that's certainly what everybody would like in a sense of sort of breathing a sigh of relief, but is that really just around the corner? It's striking in listening to the conversation how often words like feeling and attitude and uh, variations on that theme come up. And it points to an important distinction between how this will affect our perceptions and how it will affect the underlying economic and physical dynamics of the oil market and its relationship with the global economy. 
I actually agree with Robin and Ed that this is likely to affect our perceptions in significant ways. If you look at the history of oil and international politics, one of the things that you find is that oil influences international politics because people think that oil influences international politics. And then they act based on those beliefs and those actions have real world consequences. So if you think that it matters that Saudi Arabia is a big supplier of oil, you will do things because of that, regardless of what any economic advisor tells you about the fungibility of global oil markets. So actions are affected by perceptions, reality is affected by perceptions. That said, reality is also affected by reality. And as Ed has pointed out correctly, we live in a globally integrated oil market. It's not perfect. It's not the theoretical economic ideal that some people sometimes uh, claim or more often assume exists, but we essentially do. And even if we are producing as much as we consume, this is the assumption for this panel, uh, when something goes terribly wrong in the Middle East, the only way to insulate the United States from a price spike, which would be economically damaging, would be to bar exports, whether because we've not allowed construction of export capacity or because we have said by law, you're not allowed to export oil. Otherwise, it'll be drawn to other parts of the world in order to equalize prices. Now, that would be a big decision. Perhaps that's something that would happen, but I wouldn't want to assume that we're going to decide to break down this sort of open system for uh, global trade in oil. Now, there are a whole lot of other geopolitical implications. If prices go down substantially, that changes the relative power of various countries in the world. I think Ed again pointed to this important piece on FDI. We talk about the geopolitical implications uh, purely as a consumer because that we're used to thinking as a consumer. That's been how we thought for 40 years or so. But if you think as a producer, you get into fights about export policy, trade policy, foreign direct investment policy, all of which has pretty big geopolitical implications as well. Mm -hmm. So, Adam, I'm interested in your thoughts on this part of the conversation. I also wanted to step back and actually look at putting aside the U.S. for a moment, right? These have been times of high, high oil prices uh, internationally. What is your sense of what, what is the number at which uh, it really begins to scramble some of the internal politics in a country like Russia, for example, which has built uh, a lot of assumptions uh, into its budget uh, of continued high oil prices? W where does the price of oil start to affect potentially political stability in, in certain parts of the world? What's your, what's your feeling about that? Well, a number of uh, analysts, uh, both uh, in government agencies and uh, private sector companies have analyzed uh, budget break-even prices for a number of countries uh, on, on oil, if you were a large oil exporter. Um, I think Ed already pointed out that uh, a number of countries, uh, Russia and Nigeria, for example, have very high budget break-even prices. Uh, a number of others um, have fairly low uh, break-evens. If you just kind of consider that, that range, uh, most of the numbers uh, a year ago were falling in, uh, the average was falling somewhere in the low 90s, let's say 92, up to $95 a barrel. Uh, Actually, because of higher prices and uh, somewhat higher production in a number of these countries, uh, that budget break-even has come down somewhat. Uh, mm -hmm. It might be in the, the mid-80s now rather than the mid-90s. Kind of skipping over that for a second and going back to one of the, the major themes that have been brought up by virtually everybody here on the panel, I think one of the things that needs to be considered uh, is, you know, what does this really mean for the U.S.? And Ed hinted at it, that this is a huge potential positive productivity shock to the U.S. economy, right? So that could grow GDP, grow employment, uh, strengthen the dollar, shrink the trade deficit, uh, all of these things tremendously positive. Uh, one thing to, to keep in mind uh, about this and to extend it out um, globally is that uh, the U.S. Uh, has uh, managed to make more progress in, in this area, both in natural gas and oil, uh, than virtually any other uh, country around the world. And it will be interesting to see the extent to which uh, developments in the U.S. Uh, proceed into other countries. Uh, so far, mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, other than Canada and maybe Australia, it, it hasn't hasn't really moved as rapidly as you might expect it to. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. Uh, Ed, what about uh, China, for example? Uh, do we see prospects for them to experience a similar change in their uh, internal energy picture? That's why Robin is a citizen. <laughs> <laughs> um, Wait, two Eds. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it's just beginning, uh, is my uh, perception. There are, there are a lot of other things going on in the domestic Chinese uh, market, particularly uh, with gas. Uh, there needs to be preconditions of a shale gas revolution um, uh, transferring uh, into China, such as gas pricing reform, uh, which they are starting to experiment with in, in a couple of provinces. Uh, it will also potentially uh, change their relationship with Russia mm -hmm. uh, in a time of uh, uh, plenty for gas around the world. Uh, Russia's need to diversify its markets become a little bit more urgent uh, than at a time when uh, Western Europe did not have availability of, of lower price uh, uh, LNG uh, as a substitute for Russian gas. So it may be, it make it easier for the Russians and Chinese to come together on a deal, something they've been working on for a long, long time but never get there. Um, so I, th I think there are a, a number of implications for, for China, both in terms of domestic uh, gas production potential, uh, both in conventional gas, um, co-bed methane, uh, tight gas, in addition to shale gas, which pr will probably come last. We will find that out in maybe five to ten years, but not in the next couple of years. Um, and and uh, China's um, role in the international gas market will also change uh, when, when supply is plentiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ed, uh, how do you respond to the question uh, of whether we're being l letting our sort of hearts uh, lead us when it comes to uh, the prospect of being more independent from uh, the entanglements of the Middle East as a result of this? You know, I, I I'm not moved in a lot of ways <laughs> by uh, by that. I you know I think I think there's much more consensus on this issue than. Uh, otherwise might be the case. You know, clearly the U.S. has broad international interests. Clearly Mike is right in talking about the role of oil. I'm just thinking about the role of oil in the Middle East since I've been looking at the subject, or others in this room have been, when the U.S. was first interested in oil in the Middle East other than commercially developing it by companies uh, in the at least modern history. It was to, you know, make sure that Russia didn't get control over Middle East oil. And when the Cold War was over, uh, inter-regional relationships became uh, the driver rather than the Cold War. And you know, there are bound to be other, other issues that, uh, that, uh, that will arise. As long as I'm speaking, I really do want to make a point that others have made, and I think we've let go, Adam made it, and Robin has made it publicly many times in talking about the US having for as far into the future as one can think the lowest cost electricity in the world, mm -hmm. the lowest cost natural gas in the world. And it's not just this issue of, uh, of oil uh, self-sufficiency that's driving what's happening. There is really an industrial investment boom that's unfolding. It's unfolding slower than it might. It looks likely to accelerate. There's a lot of evidence that it's accelerating. The lag has been uh, some of the things that John has talked about. The lag has also been smart companies like uh, the one he used to be at, saying, hey, we've got an opportunity to negotiate good tax terms with states that want uh, our investment, want the employment. Uh, we're seeing a massive change in the petrochemical industry. It's not based on natural gas. It's not based on oil. It's based on the other thing being produced, NGLs. The uh, lowest cost ethane producer in the world has incredible implications on petrochemicals. The steel industry has become uh, really transformed. There's a symbiotic relationship between drilling and need for tubular steel, creating distribution networks and need for different kinds of tubular steel. And the, and the U.S. is seeing uh, incredible flows, inward investment into the steel industry. The manufacturing jobs that we think uh, we can look at in a very conservative way are order of magnitude between three and four million between now and uh, and 2020. So uh, the implications geopolitically include 
what's happening in the U.S. economy, and it's pretty profound. Mm -hmm. All right, I have two two-finger interventions, and then I do want to go back to these bigger picture U.S. questions, because I agree that's, that's sort of the heart of it. So both Michael and Ed Chow wanted to intervene quickly. So in the picture that Ed painted of what we worried about when we first started to worry about this, aside from as a commercial interest, is really important, because it takes us to a time in our history where we did not have as free and open of a global trading system, so preferential uh, arrangements for oil trade and preferential tariff systems and all these things made geography matter a lot more than it does today. Where we had a world superpower rival, Soviet Union, that we worried would invade and control large pieces of production and therefore be able to reduce supplies. And we're not in that world right now. But we could be in that world in a couple decades. It's very difficult to predict how the future will unfold. And one important thing to keep in mind when we talk about all of this supply picture is that its impact on the world on a sort of linear course without many changes from where we are today is very different from what the impact might be uh, if we end up in a world that is very different uh, when it comes to global trade, when it comes to global security. If we end up in that world in 20 years, then the fact that we have more abundant supplies, uh, depending on what we've uh, extracted between now and then, uh, will have potentially different implications. Uh, I learned many years ago not to disagree with Ed, um, <laughs> um, and, 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 I, and I only do it when it's necessary. Um, um, and and, and I, I certainly don't uh, disagree with him at all on the uh, positive uh, aspects, uh, profound positive aspects of, uh, on the domestic economy of the, this um, natural gas and, and, and an oil production boom in North America. I was trying to make a different point, and that point is that that self-sufficiency, if we were to achieve it, does not insulate us from the global economy. Uh, as we are finding out today, based on what's happening uh, in, in Europe right now. Uh, and so perhaps supply from the Middle East is not so critical for us anymore. But where does that, what does that leave the global economy and who's going to secure the, the, the supply lines from the Middle East? We have this kind of mixed feelings about when the Chinese in particular uh, start doing too much to protect their, their, their own interests. We feel threatened when, when they do that. Uh, when they don't do enough, we call them a free rider, right? So somewhere between the two, we've got to figure out what the mix of uh, cooperation, collaboration, uh, as we are doing, say, with the uh, Somali pirate uh, problem with, with the Ch Chinese and others right now, of how to share that global responsibility, even if uh, that Middle East supply is no longer so critical to our own economy. Mm -hmm. I would note that this has been a record year for uh, Somali piracy so far, so it might not, cooperation in and of itself might not necessarily be. <laughs> <laughs> the key to solving problems. So I want to go back and I want to ask Robin and, and John to start us off in a, in, a, in a conversation now about what are the U.S. political implications of this, both in the short term, this is an election year, uh, and we're already seeing actually both campaigns uh, in some way talking a lot more about energy than you might have expected uh, a couple years ago. Uh, but I just, I, I, I'm really curious for both of your takes, both in does energy and this, this energy boom play into the 2012 presidential campaign, and then in a more long-term sense, uh, do you see it being associated with, with one party or the other? Um, I find it fascinating that um, one word has not been mentioned once on this panel today, carbon. And um, uh, the president has said that climate uh, slash carbon uh, is one of his priorities in the next uh, administration. Um, and I think that, that frankly, if, if Waxman Markey was the basis of that was really their philosophical legislative statement, um, this was kind of a Euro green approach. It was a big transfer of wealth, it was to create a new market, it was to use government regulation to, to drive in new technologies. And um, I don't think there's much support for that in the country. Um, it's very interesting, you know, uh, last week ago, Friday, was the hottest June day ever recorded. And increasingly on the weather, or in the news and the weather, there's talk about, well, isn't it awfully hot? It seems to be hot all the time. There's something going on. Um, and so I think that the, the issue of climate um, um, is an interesting issue. I think that um, 
Uh, I think that, that uh, Governor Romney is going to come out for a much more pro-market, shifting power to the states, opening up public lands. Uh, one of the key issues is, is with EPA. Right. Uh, that's really where the power lies in this whole issue. Um, and um, the other thing is, is that you have states like Pennsylvania and Ohio, uh, and th there are a whole bunch of new oil producing states, oil and gas producing states. And um, so the, 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 the political calculus is going to change domestically. Um, but I think that uh, uh, in the end, uh, one of the president's regular taglines is he really doesn't like the oil industry. I think that's fair to say. Uh, and he wants to tax it more, and uh, it's a target. And I think there's a real danger, what some congressmen and others have said, one of the real dangers, and Ed alluded to this, is that what could screw this whole thing up is infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure. And if there's, um, um, whether it's using um, a regulation or not changing legislation, uh, I think that there's a, there is a chance that this thing could be stymied, um, and uh, it could come from Washington, mm -hmm. although it was initiated by the the, the market. Mm -hmm. John, do you agree that uh, this potentially cuts against uh, Obama, even though in many ways this has happened on his watch, whether he's had anything to do with it or not uh, is a different question. I think the politics of energy are hugely important in the national dialogue, in the uh, corporate dialogue, and it will be a major discussion factor, I think, as the campaign uh, carries on. And there are many, many points of view with respect to the politics of energy in which everyone can be right and everyone can also be wrong. <laughs> what do I mean by that? Well, let's be clear. Energy and the development of energy, and I'm talking all kinds of energy, not just oil and gas, could be the basis, as was suggested, of a whole new era of prosperity changing the whole economy, changing the revenue flow to the government, changing the deficit position of communities and states and, and the federal deficit itself if we could unleash all of that prosperity. At the same time, we choke on our waste. And I think we could actually turn waste management into part of the prosperity as well. Mm -hmm. I think the president is wearing thin when the whole discussion is around carbon, when it really should be around waste, because it's water, it's land, and it's air. Carbon only implies air. But there's a whole waste management industry that could grow with the increased uh, prosperity in the production of natural resources at the same time. I, I think the, the both and, whoever can get the both and story right to the voters, mm -hmm. I think will be more successful. This either or business just doesn't work. We've had miserable experiences the last three years with gasoline prices in the first and second quarter, leading to near recession in the third quarter, the last three years, stock market volatility. Uh, people are tired of the uncertainties uh, of, of you know, low growth, slow growth, no growth. And what people are looking for is you know, a way for the economy to rebound and sustain that rebound and to experience real growth. I think the opportunity is there. I think either party could grab it and run with it, and, and I maintain a nonpartisan position and, and who, to whomever I talk to, but the reality is this country can be poised for such incredible growth for not just for a few years, but for decades if we unleash it and let it happen. And I include waste management as an industry that's part and parcel of how we grow going forward. Hmm. Adam, do you see other ways in which uh, this can re-scramble the U.S. economy, I mean, you know, in this positive way or perhaps in not so positive a way? Are we going to become a new, uh, we're going to become an, an energy state? We're going to become a <laughs> trapped in the resource curse? Well, you know, in many ways, uh, the, this question of energy independence, uh, wherever, wherever it takes you once you get there, we already are a net exporter of coal. We don't really import a lot of electricity. Uh, EIA forecasts that will be a net export of natural gas uh, by 2020. And we had a very thorough discussion of the potential on the oil side. Um, as the only federal employee on this panel. Uh, <laughs> See, I didn't ask you whether you thought <laughs> President Obama would I, benefit from I this. I would <laughs> say that the role of the federal government has not been, uh, I don't think, has been as negative as, as some have characterized it. 
uh, natural gas um, and, and oil hydraulic fracturing. A lot of the 3D seismic technology used in this got its start in the federal labs. Uh, the independents who were responsible uh, for the breakthroughs in uh, natural gas uh, fracturing were helped tremendously by a, a federal subsidy on natural gas production. It was a dollar a million BTUs at a time when natural gas prices were very low and it was hugely significant. Uh, you might even look at that as being one of the better, fe federal, better federal policies. It was a subsidy that was put on when it was needed and was taken off when it wasn't needed anymore. Uh, there are a number of things that are going on uh, in terms of the federal government now. Um, the president was uh, out in uh, Oklahoma uh, just a few months ago uh, encouraging uh, the federal agencies across the board to speed up their permitting processes for infrastructure developments. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of things are happening, I think, that, uh, that are much more positive than what you often see in the press. Uh, so my feeling is, is that uh, the economics ultimately are going to drive this and the economics are positive. Uh, that many of the things that, uh, that we are seeing in the energy area uh, will have very uh, strong uh, implications for economic growth and that the environmental issues that, that John has brought up and others uh, can be managed. And managing those uh, will often require uh, state and federal uh, regulations, but getting those regulations right, I think, will actually help encourage development, not discourage it. So Robin challenged us uh, to uh, bring up a subject that we haven't talked about much, which is uh, global warming and how this might scramble uh, both the U.S. politics of it, but also the, the international politics of it. Um, Michael, I know that's even a part of your job description, uh, so <laughs> walk us through your scenarios here. Sure. Let me though, briefly, I think, uh, elaborate on what Adam has said, because it's important to be clear about what the president has done and what his strategy is. I mean, yes, there has been an effort to go after some relatively small tax, uh, tax breaks, tax treatment, whatever you want to call them for the industry. We're talking about something that adds up to about $4 billion a year in an industry that is far larger than that. And there's a legitimate debate about the impact of the individual provisions, but let's not blow that out of proportion. On the carbon front, it's also important to be clear that good carbon policy is perfectly consistent with the sort of oil and gas development we're talking about. Uh, if I recall correctly, in the latest uh, annual energy outlook, there's a, there are a couple special cases, one with a $15 a ton carbon price, one with a $25 a ton carbon price. That sort of brackets the possibilities of what we might have got under Waxman Markey. Uh, my recollection is that oil production increases in both of those uh, modeling exercises because the CO2 price creates an incentive to capture carbon dioxide, which can then be used to enhance oil recovery. Now, projections are not gospel, but that's a real possibility. That's actually the one big growth potential in US production that we haven't talked about, because there isn't a carbon price to create an incentive to make that supply of CO2 available. If you look at the basic economics of the issue, increased US oil production and is unlikely to have a large impact on global emissions. And increased natural gas production, particularly in the next decade or two, is likely to displace coal and therefore reduce emissions. The bigger potential impact on climate policy, I think, comes through politics. To some good extent, the discussion about climate policy to date has conflated several different challenges, one of which was greenhouse gas emissions and global warming, but another was this idea of resource scarcity that we're running out and therefore need to go in a different direction. If that piece of the coalition that wants climate policy in place vanishes because of this sense of abundance, then I think it becomes more difficult to put good climate policy in place. Now you can argue the other way. Uh, every time you run the cost estimates of a model for a cap on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, those estimates come in lower if you have more abundant natural gas because it makes it cheaper to meet your targets. So you could imagine this helping in some ways. Uh, but it certainly scrambles things. There's no question about that. Uh, one more, uh, 
I'll just make one more observation because you asked about the international politics of this. Uh, for the most part, people in the United States who care about climate change think that natural gas is good news. There are vo there's a vocal community th that thinks it's very bad news, uh, in part based on some flawed studies on the leakage of methane, and in part based on a basic belief about infrastructure trends and how we have to pick one direction or another. That is not the view in Europe. In Europe, natural gas is generally seen as a bad thing for climate change and a bad direction when it comes to climate change. And the international level, that will take us into some problems. Uh, when we go to an international meeting and say, look, we've reduced our emissions and we're displacing coal with natural gas, they'll say, natural gas, that's not a positive story on climate change. <laughs> that's a negative story. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to cause some friction. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important point. Does anyone else want to weigh in on the uh, sort of where the climate discussion goes as a result of this? Well, one point I'd make is that I think Waxman-Markey, which was over a thousand pages long, mentioned natural gas twice. But the impact on the economy and the energy system doesn't depend on how many words are devoted to a no, resource in a bill. It's, but, but it some, some, it's some, what it does to the economics. But my only point is that what happened really, uh, there was a big program um, and a lot of political capital was invested right. in it and something entirely different happened. Ed? Chow and then uh, John. Well, we're certainly uh, internationally uh, in a world of plenty, particularly on gas. Then for India and China in particular, uh, you've got the trade off of using domestic coal, which is very dirty uh, and, and which harms the, uh, uh, um, the environment, the air people breathe. And as income grow, uh, the population will become more and more concerned about uh, these matters. And if there is availability of gas, whether that's domestic gas because of shale gas revolution in, in India and China or imported gas, you, you now have a substitute that may be readily available that was not part of the equation at one time but, but will become increasingly important. And once again, that's where the energy growth and, car and therefore carbon emissions growth uh, is coming from uh, in the world. And, and that will definitely bend the curve for them. John, I know you wanted yes, to jump I, in. I think Europe's voice in the world, I think, can be loud and demanding. But Europe's overall impact on the world, I think, is not all that great when you see the world's largest economy and the world's second largest economy pretty much choosing the path that they will choose. But let me say this about the oil and gas industry. There is a very strong, and I would almost call it a passion, to do things right. Because when the industry gets it wrong, we see Macondo and we see the disasters that occur. And so when it comes to regulations, the oil and gas industry is looking for clarity and, uh, and, and, and continuity. Because clarity and continuity, you can manage. You can engineer toward it. You can make things happen with cement or with casing or with other uh, innovations in technology to actually control leaks or to stop them altogether. A and so I think clarity is important. When that clarity becomes politicized, and it's this program this year, another program another year, a new regulation this year, a new regulations pending. That becomes very frustrating, and that's when the industry kind of pushes back. But I think if there is a, a, a tendency towards best practice and a tendency toward regulation using best practice, I think you get a lot of industry cooperation, which has positive impacts on the environment. Robin? Yeah, one point I'd like to come back to, which Ed Chow alluded to, uh, is uh, there's a lot of, of shale elsewhere in the world, in China, in India, in Argentina. People thought in Poland and everything like this. But um, we estimate it takes about 1,500 uh, wells to prove up a play. Um, and with the exception of Canada, there's no place in the world where they've drilled more than 100 wells. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened in the United States, it was a, a good, perfect storm in the sense that we had a huge service sector we had uh, transparent gas markets. We had the ability of independence to get financing. High prices were driving it. Um, uh, there was uh, uh, a gas market. Uh, there was uh, gas uh, gathering, gas transmission. Everything was in place for this to happen if these guys could figure it out. If you go to places like China, and, and we've done work with the, uh, the NDRC and other groups, 
Um, their fiscal system is all wrong. They don't have a, it's going to take these other places a long, long time. And the point I would make is also, I said the opening, I think that frankly some renewables may have much more application in those places mm -hmm. than they do in the United States and I think it should be encouraged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've had a very patient audience here and I do want to give you a chance to jump in with your questions too. We have a lot of folks so if you can keep your questions to be really a question and uh, give us your name and where you're from that would be terrific. Uh, Ma'am, we'll go ahead and start off with you. Stephanie Kinney. Um, Stephanie Kinney, Maxwell School. Um, what you are positing today is important, but it is not very well known or understood. Um, what kinds of actions do you see as important in the next year or so to get the public more broadly educated, and in particular, uh, university students? I have um, students coming out with tremendous debt who think they want to be NGOs, which will pay them nothing and they won't get their debts paid. Um, energy is not something they think of. They're, they take my sustainability and public policy course, and yet the one area where you could both combine uh, earning a living, a real job, and doing something worthwhile, if you have the sustainability frame, would seem to be energy. What suggestions do you have uh, to attract the students coming out now into the areas that you need? John, this uh, seems to go to your point. This is, this is a critical factor as a public matter of national well-being. The lack of information that permeates our society on all matters relating to energy and the environment is, is a very serious problem. And as I used to say in API meetings, American Petroleum Institute meetings, if you don't have the public on your side, then the public is against you. And the way to get the public on your side is information. And I, put, I founded Citizens for Affordable Energy for specifically that reason, and spent seven days a week trying to engage people at all social and economic levels across the country just to get information out. My website, citizensforaffordableenergy.org. And it is basic, simple information about what it is, what's possible, what's not, what's, what's, what's important. We can't count on media because media have a different job to do, which is about exposing, not educating. There is, a, 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 I think, an outcome of some form of education and so I welcome media all the time and, and, and embrace media as an outlet, but it is not media's job to educate the public on energy. Our school systems badly lack any approach to energy. It's not taught. Oklahoma is think, the only state in the nation that is part of a state curricula mandates energy education at all levels of the school system. And, and so we have this huge undertaking that has to happen for any of the success that we're, we potentially have in front of us to actually occur. And, and so I think it is not helpful when politicians vilify the very source of economic value creation that comes from all sources of energy. And whether it's right-wing politicians bad-mouthing renewable energy or left-wing politicians bad-mouthing hydrocarbon energy, it's simply not helpful. I know why they do it. Everyone knows why they do it. But it doesn't do any good other than for their own electoral uh, results, perhaps. But we, I think we have to undertake this as parents, as leaders in society, as teachers of those who are coming after us. And we owe it to our citizens to do that on a sustained basis. Mm -hmm. Adam, I know you wanted to jump in too. Right, well, I do come from the Energy Information <laughs> Administration. <laughs> <Your job. laughs> and I just have to say that uh, EIA has been trying very hard to help in this area, John. Um, if you do a internet uh, search, uh, you know, use a search engine and, and type in energy information, we come up first. Uh, there's, uh, it, interestingly to me, because I did this the other day, the third hit that you get in Google or Bing if you type in energy information is the EIA kids page. It's very, very popular. It's got a lot of really good basic information on where energy comes from, how it's transformed, how it's used. 
and uh, and it's uh, I think uh, uh, extremely popular, and I hope that that kind of thing filters down. The EIA website uh, has uh, been redesigned; it gets uh, hundreds of thousands of hits, um, you know, daily, and uh, it's uh, it's a very very I think useful uh, tool, not just for kids. Uh, but for everybody uh, in the analytical community and in the policy community that's looking for, for answers to some of these basic questions. All right, I want to get to some more uh, questions here. Uh, sir. Can, can you wait for the microphone? Because I think we're being taped. Bendering Department of Energy, kind of a two-part question. Um, Mr. West, your firm puts out, I think it's, I don't know the exact title, but the top 50 every year, it's the energy companies. I wondered first how this might shake up that list in a sense that much of the revolution, the development we're talking about is in the Western Hemisphere. What does this mean for previous national champions like Total, BP, others, given that a lot of this is going on in the U.S. and otherwise a lot of the traditional uh, natural gas and oil plays are still under state control in countries like Saudi Arabia and others. And secondly, then, going back to the geopolitical implications of this, and this is maybe for the broader panel, we've talked about, uh, Mr. Chow mentioned the shared global responsibility, but we talked about the U.S. versus our engagement with India and China. What about our, and or the Gulf producers, our security agreements with them? What about our traditional uh, consuming country allies, South Korea, Japan, Europe? What does it mean for them if the U.S. is potentially more secure? Good question. Okay. Uh, in terms of, of the, uh, the industry, uh, what's happening in North America uh, isn't going to change the list very much of the top 50 companies. One of the interesting things is that the, it's important to understand that the North American unconventional plays tend to be, uh, it's a different process. You drill thousands of wells. What big companies, what the Exxons and Chevrons and Totals of the world do, they develop enormous capital-intensive, engineering-intensive projects, big offshore projects, Shell, big offshore projects in the Gulf of Mexico or West Africa or the Tar Sands Project in Canada. Um, and uh, that's their business. This North American business, you see who's done it, it's largely the independents. Some of the majors are looking at this and wondering if they can come into this. It's clearly a big resource play, but basically independents run their business for production growth. The majors run their business for returns. And it's really, a, it's a different model, and it's a real challenge to them. Um, although the majors are trying to figure out how to come into this. Um, uh, Ed, do you want to touch on the second part of the question? Uh, I, I guess my feeling is that it, it doesn't change things as much as people would like to, as quick, or maybe as quickly as we would like to. Susan pointed out rightly that the Somali piracy problem hasn't been solved. Uh, but. Uh, just think of what it would be like if we didn't share that responsibility. Uh, this is the beginning of our experiment. We haven't done uh, this sort of thing very much before. And it would be interesting to see how that goes. It is a shared responsibility with our traditional allies uh, as well. Uh, but in a time of plenty, it allows you to think more about the shared uh, protection of the global commons with people we were once concerned about as their power inevitably, I would submit, uh, increases in, in places like India and, and China. But the traditional uh, allied relationship will be in place and I assume that they will continue to uh, want us to play a, 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 a fair share of that. How do you define that fair share, I think is the, the, the interesting question. Mm -hmm. Pick up on this one quickly. I think there's a bigger impact on the gas side than the oil side for a lot of the traditional allies. I think on the oil side, the biggest immediate benefit uh, would be somewhat lower oil prices, which would accrue to everyone, not just to the United States. Um, the biggest potential downside is if the U.S. misreads the situation and scales back its investment in security uh, around the world, which will affect everyone. Uh, but on natural gas, we're already seeing consequences. The fact that the United States is not buying uh, gas, LNG from the Middle East has freed up supplies and put Europe in a much stronger position with respect to Russia. And that's shaking up the geopolitics of gas in Asia. Uh, we, uh, sorry, in Europe. We could see changes in Asia as well. We're obviously having a conversation in this country about potential natural gas exports. Uh, I don't see them by themselves being revolutionary, but they're an important piece of the puzzle that gives consumers, particularly Korea and Japan, 
uh, more leverage in dealing with producers and potentially take some of the politics out of natural gas trade. Uh, that's a good thing for U.S. allies and a good thing for the United States. Okay, we've had a patient gentleman here in the front, and I'm going to try to get to as many of you uh, as, as we can. Robert Shredda, President of International Investor. Uh, if you'll forgive me, but I, from what I've heard so far, I think you guys missed the biggest story here. And that is that instead of the one single world price market for petroleum and other energy commodities, we are starting to see a divergence between what I call Western Hemispheric pricing and the Brent price, for example. We saw as much as a 20% divergence between Brent per barrel oil prices at one point this year, and that spread seems to, uh, to be continuing. We believe, at least uh, from our analysis and talking to a lot of experts, that we're going to, this is something big that's happening here in terms of an independence. And it's going to uh, put us in a position where suddenly, uh, the, the, here, let me bring this to a question for you. Suddenly we're going to, we're going to see a world in which um, not only is the United States capable of operating on its own, the pricing mechanism will be different for our hemisphere than the rest of the world. We will be less concerned with what happens in terms of crises overseas. The real question becomes, with the pressure on the federal deficits, do people start turning and say, we should price or at least tax the barrels that go into our domestic economy differently than those that are exported ab abroad? Mm -hmm. We've seen other nations do this, Norway, uh, Russian Federation, and they actually bring in a lot of tax revenue by putting heavier, larger taxes on the energy that is consumed outside of their country. Mm -hmm. Do you see the possibilities of this? Mm. That's a word we haven't heard till now. Well, it would violate the Constitution of the United States to place an export tax on it, anything. I mean, that's just as a basic rule, which has been reaffirmed repeatedly by the Supreme Court. So that makes it less likely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any well, I, I, I think I disagree with the premise fundamentally. Uh, it is true that the differential between Brent and WTI has reversed mm -hmm. uh, itself, and, and that is for a lot of technical reasons that we probably shouldn't get into on this panel. Uh, but they still track each other. It's, it's not like, you know, consistently Brent rises and, and WTI falls. Uh, the, the, it is true the differential has flipped. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the world pricing uh, relationships in terms of a global market has changed at all. Uh, the more Norwegians were not insulated from the effects of Rita or Katrina. Their oil prices went up at the same time, uh, even though it had nothing to do with them, even though their net exporter, their mm -hmm. uh, uh, prices uh, still went up. So I, I, I don't uh, uh, agree with the premise of the question. <laughs> Okay. Sir. Oh, well. Oh, you mean me or something? I, it's okay. You go ahead and then we'll get the, the other gentleman. Sorry. It's okay. Vladimir and Karo Varea Group. We basically had a long discussion now about, I call it a supply shock, abundance, new sources. How about demand shock? In your forecast, in our China demand is forecasted to grow, but a lot of people are discussing that China may experience much faster oil consumption growth, if the car industry, you know, they assume driving patterns similar to the United States and all that stuff. So uh, I'd just be interested in your opinion around that issue. Okay. Ed Morse. Yeah, I, you know, if, if, we, if there's a little bit of controversy over what we think we know about supply, there's significantly <laughs> more controversy about what we think we know about demand. Um, I, think, I think there are a couple of issues that you raise are, that are really important. One is what is the share of world GDP that goes into energy costs? When uh, Brent prices were moving toward $130 uh, a barrel not so long ago, three months ago, um, the percentage of global GDP going into energy was at its record level. It was at the same level that it was at in the latter part of the 1970s. Um, you had to do a lot of arithmetic to get there, but uh, I'm pretty, sh pretty sure that that was the case, uh, which may be one reason why there is really a cap on prices because the impact on 
the global economy at, at a certain level is really very, is very high. The other observation I would make, uh, uh, and this goes to issues about what we think about China uh, in particular, let alone India, uh, is that uh, demand doesn't slow down. It comes to a tipping point. And on the history of European Union of the original EEC-6 or of Japan uh, in 1973-74 or of Korea through the late 1990s or Malaysia and Taiwan is that they had incredible growth. There was double-digit growth basically in all of these cases. Uh, and then a wall was hit uh, all of a sudden and that level of, of petroleum product demand has never been exceeded. Japan's record year of product demand was 1974. The six countries of the original EEC, their record year of petroleum product demand was 1974. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, double-digit acceleration. China. China's not had double-digit acceleration. It has on power uh, generation requirements. Uh, if you look at China, and there's a lot of controversy about the data, there's a lot of controversy about what might be going on, but two years ago, June or July, uh, the annualized growth of demand for power gen in China was 20%. A year ago, it was 10%. Today, it's 2 to 3%. Uh, petroleum product demand in China this year has grown less than 1% year on year. There's something going on, and it may be that the structure of the economy is changing. It may be that the big period of time of focusing on infrastructure, commodity-intensive infrastructure, has come to an end. Or it may be that the economy is really in a slump. It will, time will tell. But to the degree we know about demand, um, it's that it, it can come to a tipping point. So I promised that we would end right on time. So I'm going to actually disclose this with a quick lightning round uh, to all of our uh, panelists, because I think this has been a terrific conversation. And I know there's so much more we could get at. I'd like to ask everybody for a winner and a loser from the premise of our question, which is that this, this American energy boom has happened, uh, of the, of in particular, one that we haven't talked about yet so far. Uh, and Michael, because you just looked at me, <laughs> you're first. <laughs> that we haven't talked about <laughs> yet? Or you can resurface We've one. We've talked then. about every country in the world, <laughs> as far as I can, um, as far as I can tell. Uh, winner, uh, the United States. Uh, loser? Thank you for the suggestion. <laughs> Russia. <laughs> The audience is going to get to vote on this uh, afterwards, uh, so uh, Adam. I, I think that the, uh, the winner is the average American wage earner. Uh, I think uh, wages go up uh, when we uh, develop more, and if we can manage the environmental issues, which I believe we can, uh, everybody wins uh, here. As far as losers are concerned, I, I don't really see it that way. I mean, I think that uh, positive development here doesn't mean that uh, anybody has to lose. Uh, whether here or overseas. What about those dictators in the Middle East? Ed. Yeah, no, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to believe in one globalized world in which everyone shares in a growing pie. But the fact is there are winners and losers. And uh, the audience and Michael picked on the obvious winners and losers being the US and, and Russia, not, not simply because uh, uh, what's happening is related to oil and gas exports, but Russia's a big commodity dependent country. and. It looks like what's happening in oil and gas is happening across commodity land. Uh, but I, I think single crop countries that are in the commodity business uh, really are in a zero-sum world when it comes to this business. And, uh, and that makes for a significant amount of political turmoil. It's not a geopolitically positive issue. And I would note that uh, as I think through the market consequences of, uh, of what's unfolding just on the oil market, with ripple effects on the gas market, this is going to be a significantly more volatile price environment rather than a less volatile price environment. And the winners and losers of that are the same. If you're a commodity producer in a really volatile uh, price environment in which you're struggling to keep market share and revenue, it's not a pretty picture. Robin. Um, I would take it a little differently. The, uh, I think the United States is a winner and all that kind of thing. I think a potential big loser on this, frankly, um, is the environmental movement and green concerns. And I think that that could be a big mistake. And um, I come back to my point earlier that this is not the end of history. This is, this is not a static situation. And both technology and politics will c continue to drive a lot of changes. And um, it ain't over. Uh, and I would urge people to 
keep pushing ahead. Uh, winner, I would say, consumers around the world, uh, not just in the United States, uh, at, at a time of uh, where you, you, you could have lower energy prices and a different set of energy choices depending on how you value the environment, uh, climate change, and so on. You have a different menu of options than you uh, maybe previously uh, thought you had. Uh, Hugo Chavez, just the name. Someone <laughs> who hasn't uh, uh, been, uh, uh, been uh, called upon yet uh, as a loser um, uh, out of this. And I agree with Ed, obviously, whenever I can. Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, but it's for, it, it's <laughs> absolutely the, 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 the prudent thing to do. Uh, it, but for those same uh, um, single commodity uh, economies, it could also uh, become a, 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 a winning uh, situation for them in the long run in the sense that uh, high, very high energy prices have enabled an lot, awful lot of bad economic policies uh, in those countries. And, and a lower uh, price of, uh, of oil uh, in particular may be a, uh, allow room uh, for different kind of economic thinking and reform that's very necessary for those countries. But so maybe in the long run, they're winners too. John. The winner, I think, will be North Americans. Uh, if we get this right from a government policy standpoint, I think North Americans broadly will win the most. And I think we will start a multi-decade uh, new generation of prosperity in this part of the world. The big loser, I think, will be OPEC, with the exception of Saudi Arabia which I think has actually more enlightened global thinking than any of the other OPEC nations. They'll find their way. But I think OPEC will descend into chaos as, as an organization and will have, they, they don't know now how much they're hated by the entire world, but they will find out as <laughs> things uh, unfold. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm, sure it's I'm not sure it's an upbeat note to end on, but uh, certainly a provocative one. Uh, what a terrific discussion, and thank you uh, to the New America Foundation uh, and Steve for hosting us, and uh, to all of you for coming today. Thank you.